Kurt, welcome. Great to have you. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Linda. I'm so pleased to be here. So let's just talk about Q1 earnings from yesterday. So lots of the metrics going in the right direction, which is great to see. But I wanted to talk a little bit first about the hospitality solutions business. Um, I think you've said double digit revenue this year. And I'm interested to know, is that purely from kind of the Wyndham re-signing and the Hyatt new signing? Or are we talking about market growth and kind of travel momentum in general? Yeah, great question. And so for Clarity, Hospitality Solutions is our hotel IT business, which is different from our hotel distribution business, which is part of effectively the GDS. So in HS or Hospitality Solutions, there are three key drivers of growth. Number one is just same store sales with our existing clientele. Um, RevPAR for the hotel industry is at 3 to 4% now, which is slowed down, but we ride on the success of our client base. That's one component of growth. Number two is we're winning and we're v- winning very consistently in our core CRS offering and with PMS as well. And so Hyatt's an important win, a very important enterprise win. We'll begin implementing this quarter. We'll be largely complete by this time next year. And we have a rich pipeline and many other customers that we're implementing as well. And then last, we have developed organically and acquired a few elements to form the Synexus Retail Studio suite of products, which effectively allow hoteliers to sell everything within their four walls very dynamically, and then also sell anything outside of their walls, sightseeing, tours, do all of that through all channels at their fingertips. And that is resonating very, very well. So our expectation and what we've communicated to the market is that this will be a 10% plus revenue Kager business going forward um, with strong high teen double digit margins by the end of next year. So this business was a negative $30 million EBITDA business in 2022. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. We expect to do about 40 million of EBITDA this year, 70 million next year. And so this is a SaaS business that's really beginning to take off. So just going back, I think you're referring to the uh, tech assembly acquisition, which is a year ago, and, and that obviously to boost retailing capabilities, which, you know, I think it's probably only in the last kind of year, year and a half that we've been talking about hotels really wanting to sell more than just a, you know, a bed or maybe right. the restaurant, the bar, the things that are actually in the physical property. With the capabilities that you now have, will you start or are you already starting to address the 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 kind of middle to lower end as, a, as well as the Hyatts and those bigger groups? Yeah. And so to be clear, we acquired a firm called Nuvola, which basically is a messaging engine so that when you create something that you want to merchandise, it pushes that to all of your distribution channels. Um, which is very important because many hotels don't have the mechanics to do that. As you said, we acquired TechSembly as well. And so this is a a product set that we can sell through a chain or a hotel property group. We can also sell at a property level. Um, And it's interesting. We've built effectively a Cadillac. There are massive capabilities here. One of the challenges is the resource level of hoteliers to take advantage of the software Um, because it does take time you have to configure it for what you want to sell. And we provide the whole toolkit for that. But in a world where RevPAR has slowed down and is not on fire the way it was in the last couple of years, and again, RevPAR is at 3 to 4% now, um, hoteliers have a urgent need to become better at retailing and to look for these top line opportunities. So I think there's a very good marriage in terms of what we're bringing to market and the needs of our hotel customers. It's interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes... A lot of what we're seeing is some of the newer players coming into the market. And I'm talking about people like the Social Hub and Lock who are doing these things. And it's less perhaps the what we might call the more traditional, longer standing players. Do you think that's for any particular reason? Um, look, look, hotel is a, it's a massive uh, industry. By any accounts, there's about a million properties around the world. You have chain dominance in certain markets, in many markets like EMEA and, and Asia Pacific. You've got a massive amount of independent hoteliers that are very small. Um, and everybody's looking at this market, which is highly fragmented and saying there's significant opportunity. So I'll give you an example. Even though Synexus Sabre is the largest CRS company in the world by number of properties, we only have 40 to 50,000 properties. So you can say we have single digit market share, even though we're the number one player. That speaks to an endless market opportunity and it's attractive for new entrants. What we're looking at is with our existing clientele and then new properties is how do we bring continued value to them and enable them to compete as true e-commerce retailers 
that, oh, by the way, happen to operate these great products. Mm-hmm. Would you would you ever envisage a time, and I've asked this to, to competitors of yours as well, where, you know, that hotel technology side overtakes the, the kind of traditional air distribution side? Um, you know, for Sabre, you're talking about for, for our business? Yeah. Uh, you know, typically your two largest content categories in global travel are air and our hotel. Right. Oh, by the way, our two biggest focus areas, whether it's on technology or distribution, are air yeah. and hotel. Um, that's what matters most to our customers. That's where we can deliver the most value. Um, I don't know whether uh, what the future holds. What I can tell you is we're very focused on the distribution uh, investments we're making. We're very focused on airline IT, and we're very focused on the hotel IT business. And I see green shoots and great opportunity in all three of them. Fair enough. Um, now, going back a couple of years, you did talk about a kind of personalization engine, which would be kind of AI driven. Um, is that something that's, you know, actively now being used, being implemented across hotels and across the airlines or one versus the other? Is that happening? Yes, yeah, so we've actually we've implemented Google's Vertex AI and machine learning capabilities into a number of products that both face airlines and hoteliers. So that's being incorporated into what I discussed, the retail studio suite of solutions yep. on hotel. And then what we call the retail intelligence suite, which is airline facing, which helps them basically with pricing, revenue management type solutions, um, is the tip of the spear on what's called offer. Um, AI and ML are, are deeply embedded there. And so there is the ability for our supplier, airline and hotel customers to begin to do personalization with that. Um, one of the important things around personalization is it requires a tremendous amount of data, which we sit on. And then our, obviously our customers have a lot of data in and of themselves. So that is, be, I wouldn't say it's a huge part of what's done today. More so they'll look and they'll say, okay, if we're marketing to Linda, we'll say, what are the characteristics of Linda? And we'll put you in a box with other similar characteristics. And we may make a specific offer based on that. But it doesn't go to the level of saying Linda gets an offer that nobody else in the world would get per se. Right. I think that will come in the future. Um, and then there's a the question of generative AI, which offers a totally different dimension than I'll call traditional or legacy AI, which is a funny, funny yeah. way to say it. Um, I think there's tremendous promise to do more and more of that in the future. But again, it's the software coupled with the intelligence that the data and the rich data provides. And so and I do have some specific small data set makes it um, makes it more nominal. Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt you there. I do have some specific AI questions for you just later on in the conversation yeah. um, pertaining to the three kind of use cases you talked about on the call yesterday. So just park that thought for a minute. Um, let's let's talk about NDC. Um, still a very low base, 1%, you said uh, yesterday on the call. Um, but you also said significant growth this year. Do we still think single-digit kind of penetration? Yeah, when, so... There are two dimensions to when you look at NDC. We know that, uh, as I talked about last quarter, some large OTAs with some large airlines have, they've had direct connects in place for a long period of time. And they perhaps have changed from an Edifact to an NDC connection. Uh, they're the same connections we have. And so there's there's some theoretical NDC happening there. Now, importantly, if you're an airline, what is NDC? In its simplest form, it's taking that which the airline markets through its airline.com channel and basically just putting that same content through the b2b channel so yeah. for otas there's less disruption because effectively they're marketing and selling in a way that's very similar to what the airline.coms are doing yeah and there's perhaps less um business complexity in what they're doing versus say what a tmc is doing so when you look at the landscape today um for tmcs and for brick and mortar agencies uh, what we report and what our competitors have reported and what you see is adoption of NDC is only about 1% of the total. A big reason for that is that while the airlines have, have had NDC in place for quite a while, and there have been numerous numerous folks who have plugged into the, airline, to the airline's NDC API, the downstream impact has been challenging. So for example, does NDC integrate with Edifact or other content sources so that your shopping algorithms and your preferencing works? Does it integrate into your workflow automation so that you don't have degradation of user experience, productivity, efficiency, et cetera? We have largely solved those things now. The shopping is seamless. 
we solved over the last year about 600 unique functionality or use case uh, issues for our TMC and brick and mortar customers so that the Edifact and NDC content behaves relatively similarly and, and the differentials are, are not nominal. So I think we're at a tipping point now where, and I'd say we're also, we're fully available through any channel, desktop, through mobile apps, we're in all of the key online booking tools. Um, and so for a an agency who wants to consume NDC and is ready for it, we think we have the best platform in the marketplace. Now, if you're an agency, you're a TMC, for example, you probably have a lot of other scripts and technologies that hang off of the GDS. And so there's a lot of downstream changes that the agency needs to make as well mm -hmm. to make sure that this is done in a way that is that actually helps their competitive posture in the marketplace. But I do think that as you go through the year, you're going to see NDC grow substantially. I think you'll still be at probably a, when you look system-wide, at probably you know maybe 3 to 5% by the end of the year, but not higher right. than that. Um, but again, be, because it's off a low base, um, it's really going to depend upon the readiness of the buyers in terms of what they're looking for. Um, you have to be very careful, for example, if you if you simply take a feed from an NDC API, the the rate uh, information can be what I'll call rate vomit, meaning there's just so much there. How do you sort through it? it, it what we do now. is we provide fairly sophisticated algorithms that provide relevance of search. We make sure we don't have dupes. Um, and so we're making sure it, whether you're a customer shopping in an online booking tool or you're a trained travel counselor, that you're able to see things in a way that is actually time efficient. And so, again, I think we've solved many of those things, but there's still going to be teething issues as we go forward, making sure that the airlines have uh, really the compute capability to operate with speed and to do this as they want. Uh, because selling in a corporate environment or maybe what a, 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 a leisure brick and mortar agent do, it's a different buying experience and a different consumer expectation than somebody who's on the airline.com site or somebody who's at an OTA. Um, but again, but again, I do think it's going to grow measurably from this low point. So, I mean, you have mentioned the work that the you know the buyer, the TMC community needs to do. Do they do they get that need to to invest and 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 kind of step up to the plate now? Do you think? Yes, I do think so. Um, you know, I think where airlines have employed a win win strategy, which is we we the airline want to market and sell our products more dynamically than we have before. We want to show the virtues of our individual products and investments we've made. And, and we're looking at it that way. I think that that's received very well by the buying community. Where it's, we want to compel you to do something because we think it's good for us, even if you're not ready for it, that, that's not received as well. Mm -hmm. But I think that given the movement that's happened in the market, and it's both, there's not many carrots, but there's some sticks out there. Right. I think that for TMCs and for brick and mortar agencies, you know, they're going to be compelled to do this strategically. Um, I speak to many of them. They're making material investments. They're going through a change program, um, but they understand that this is the future and that they need to prepare for it. So, so the, you know, that growth, what, what's what's going to, to, to drive it? Is it a combination of, you know, the differing airline stances? Is it the TMCs, the tech readiness from the GDS industry and the wider tech industry? Is it all of the above? What is going to really kind of drive the momentum yeah, this year? Look, if you, um, NDC in its simplest form is the desire of airlines to sell dynamically in B2B as they do in B2C. There's mm -hmm. tremendous virtue in that. Um, for some, it's about maybe better control of distribution or trying to change the physics of how travel distribution operates. Um, and and that's, a, that's a dynamic in the marketplace. If you're a TMC or you're a brick and mortar leisure agent, for example, you've got to make sure that you're bringing the most comprehensive suite of content in an intelligent manner to your customer and you're probably providing them the, the right choice, the right transparency, but they also want an efficient process and they want to make sure that the things that they become accustomed to, for example, traveler tracking or, you know, price recheck or those types of things, that sure. those things still work and are not broken. And they don't want to pay more for what they had yesterday. They don't want to go backwards, but yes, I, I think it's a combination of, Finally, the the intermediaries, including Sabre, and I think probably we and one of our competitors are best positioned to solve this at scale. Um, having solved the mousetrap in the middle, the buyers or the TMCs and, and freaking le leisure agencies, they've done a lot of work on their part. 
And so there's a lot more collaboration today than there was two years ago. And I think we're going to get there because of that working. Um, this tends to work when somebody raises their hand and says, I'd like to change the way this is done. Let's right. talk about how we do that. And then if everybody works in concert, that can happen at speed. If one person raises their hand and says, we're changing it and this is how it's going to work. And without consulting others, it's a little bit harder. Um, but I think we're at a, at a good point now where the industry is, is moving in the right direction for the most part. I mean, one could argue that, you know, 10 odd years ago, IATA representing the airlines went, we're changing, this is how we're going to do it. And, and now here we are. So, it, you know, yeah, and now I remember airlines the IATA statement advice. of principles came out in 2012. Um, mm. I, I remember sitting at a, at a at a European football match with customers reading this. Um, so here we are 12 years later. Um, when we collaborate, we can do amazing things in this industry. Right. Yeah. Okay. The full stop on that one. Um, now, you did say in the, in the earnings call yesterday, no evidence of disintermediation in the TMC or any channel shift, which I guess I find kind of curious given um, American Airlines stance and some others. Um, again, is that because of the very low base? Or, or I mean, the, I'm just thinking there must be some disintermediation. Yeah, so let me, let me separate managed corporate travel and unmanaged corporate travel. In managed corporate travel, um, if you want to use a TMC and the GDS is approximate an operating system for a TMC, um, if you unplug a piece of content, now you try to plug it in and it doesn't work with your shopping and it doesn't work with your workflow automation, it just, it destroys your ability to operate efficiently. And mm -hmm. so I think in managed travel, there's been no disintermediation that I can see or I'm aware of. Um, and if you listen to the comments of large TMCs, they're saying, we're going to use the GDSs who have solved this to do this at scale. It, it goes back to if you're in financial services and you get all your data through Bloomberg, you can get data that's outside of Bloomberg if something's not connected there, but it's less efficient for you. It's no different for a travel management company or a brick and mortar leisure agency. When you go to unmanaged corporate travel, that's followed over time a more normal channel distribution curve, where a lot of that goes to TMCs, some of that goes to OTAs, some of that goes to supplier direct. I don't think that that's changed at all. And if you went to the average consumer, they don't know what NDC is. They don't know no, what direct and, is. And nor should they, frankly. Nor should they. So I don't think that there's been much change there. With brick and mortar leisure agency, we've seen no evidence of any moved. Where there has been, quote, disintermediation, as I mentioned earlier, is with large OTAs direct connecting with large airlines. That's right. not NDC specific. That phenomenon has existed for about 15 there's years. There's a direct connects, yeah, yeah. And there's certainly more volume going through there today than there was five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, but for an OTA, they have a more simpler technical model uh, than does an offline or a TMC agent. Um, so again, um, I don't foresee a lot of risk there to our business. And I think actually the platform we've built, which is a multi-source approach toward Edifact, NDC, and the long tail of low-cost carrier content, with all the business logic we've put in front of that, actually perhaps makes us even more valuable both to airlines who want to sell and buyers than we were yesterday. Now, one of the things you mentioned was you said <clears throat> you're kind of the progressive offer and order. Um and you've got significant commercial product announcements coming. So can you say anything more on that at this point? Yeah, I'll say we have, um, with Offer and Order, we've been at this uh, preceding my arrival to Sabre, um, building what is, I don't want to say the next generation of PSS, but it's it will be eventually a replacement for the PSS. Offer, think about it as offering more modern retailing and merchandising. And Order is changing the operating side of the business that's reliant upon the PSS. Um, I think offer is going to make progress more rapidly. Order is going to take more time because it's going to be more disruptive to the airline. Um, but these are multi-year change outs. Um, we've built a fully modularized cloud-based set of solutions. We're very focused on making sure that uh, that works with and for the Sabersonic clientele first. Um, but we actually have signed our first non-Saber customer. Um, we're in conversation with a number of customers that are on other PSS solutions. And what we have been told is, is that what we have built is the best architected solution 
And our solution does not require looking back or being connected to the PSS. It can operate in a modular fashion separate. I think that's different from what our competitors have built, which are uh, more, uh, it's a modular solution, but it ties back to the existing infrastructure. So you'll hear more about that. We're making very good progress. It is a key investment area for us. And it'll be an interesting journey. IATA has talked about everybody being fully migrated to offer order by 2030. Right. But if you look at the top 20 or 30 airlines in the world, most of them are still in the investigative phase. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that what you'll see is this be more of a continuum where you'll see progress happen over time, but it will not be a big bang cutover per se. Now, if we accept, you know, there will be a certain amount of disruption on the offer and order implementation. Does it create real change faster than NDC? Well, NDC, we're 12 years in and with very low adoption. <laughs> um I think with offer order, it it's going to depend airline by airline. First of all, offer order is more the way a low-cost carrier operates already today. Yeah. The full-service carrier who has a much more complex operation and perhaps channel approach towards selling, um, you know, the PSSs that they're operating on are somewhere between 20 and 40 years old typically. So the the pace of innovation on those PSSs is not the same as what you can do with more modern cloud-based technology. Um, so I, I don't know that this should not be disruptive because if you are a downstream player, if you're a buyer, all you'll know is content may be exposed to you differently, for example, or maybe when you go to the airport, you get a different and better experience than you had before. For the carrier, again, offer is not going to be that disruptive. Order will be a disruptive because mm. if you think about a low-cost carrier, just the way they're, op they're organized operationally, the way they do pricing and revenue management, network planning tends to be a bit different than when the way full, full service carriers do it. So for the carrier that wants to take absolute benefit of what order promises, they're going to have to rethink their entire operating model. And so it may be disruptive within the confines of the airline, but probably not outside of the airline. NDC is probably not disruptive within the confines of the airline, um, has been challenging outside of the confines of the airline. So oh, it may be different. But I think in 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 our case, we're very focused on how do we help our airline customers become best in class merchandisers um, and really continue to differentiate themselves and have the most efficient, best operation in the world. That's what our focus is. Um, and I think that as you look long term at, at where the market is and our offering, I'm very optimistic about the growth prospects for Sabre and about the value that we can bring to the airline customer base. So Let's talk a little bit about industry consolidation. And I mean, Amex, DBT, CWT, that's the obvious one, right? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it needed? Will the overall distribution landscape be better for it? So th there obviously have been two recent uh, announcements in corporate travel, uh, obviously Amex, GBT, and CWT, and then um, Steve Singh's group with Spot Nana acquiring direct travel. So yeah. first of all, all these folks are customers of ours. They're all important customers of ours. And we're going to continue to support them in their current configuration or if they go into a new configuration. When you take a step back without commenting on any of these individually, uh, corporate travel is a mature sector undergoing a lot of change. And I think not dissimilar to what you saw in consumer travel perhaps 20 years ago with the rise of the OTAs and consolidation that, that happened there, um, TMCs are in a technology arms race that is not dissimilar to what you saw on the OTA side. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about the technology arms race, scale typically matters. Um, and, you know, there, there are going to be um, the needs of, of what that service model and the te technology model look like. It needs to evolve with perhaps a, a faster pace than it did historically. So one of the ways that you can make yourself more competitive is to consolidate and try to make sure that you can bring things to market faster. So it's one of the ways to compete. It's a natural phenomenon that you often see in mature markets with lots of margin pressure and lots of uh, innovation happening. So I think it's very natural. Um, it was certainly happening pre-COVID and it's going to happen post-COVID. Um, and again, we want to make sure that we're in a position where, whether it's the TMC or the airline or the hotelier, that we're best supporting them for the choices that they want to make. So uh, one of the things uh, you talked about 
and you've talked about the last 20 minutes as well as on the call yesterday, was the, the modular technology that you've built, cloud, obviously, that the fact that it's modern, it's no longer this monolithic mainframe, um, and how you feel that that's put you in a very important position, um, competitive position. So, you know, I was sitting there thinking, well, actually, most of your competitors and other travel companies more widely have also adopted cloud technology and also building more modularly. So does does the cloud not democratize? Well, what makes you in a in a stronger uh, sort of competitive position than you think perhaps you were? Um, look, this will sound crazy, but I don't worry too much about competition. I worry about our ability to execute against our ambitions. Mm -hmm. um, what I'll talk what I'll talk about is what we've done. So when you look at our distribution business, we have four key growth strategies. Um, number one is the multi-source air content platform. I think what we have built, what's coming to market is best in breed. And think about it as my bad analogy would be if Edifact is cable television and NDC is streaming, and those are very bad analogies. We've integrated the two with a lot of business logic around it. So imagine if you went back 15 years ago and the cable companies had foreseen the coming of streaming and they seamlessly integrated these disparate content sources. They normalize them. They push them out through your existing module, the television. They also allowed you to consume it in any other module you want. And you could have on-demand or live TV. Well, that's effectively what we've done with the multi-source air content platform. Now, one of the differences is we've done that with scale, with resiliency, and with speed. And it's one thing to build something. It's it's a different thing for it to work with massive load against it. And so we know that, that ours has industrial capability. Number two is we're very focused on distribution share expansion, which is the build out of additional functionality and feed on the street to compete in markets and segments where we have been subscale traditionally. Three is around hotel distribution, which I mentioned, our content yeah. service with lodging platform. Outside of the largest OTAs in the world and outside of hoteliers, most intermediary sellers are not that good at marketing and selling hotels. So we think in terms of the aggregation of content, the um, algorithms that we have around search, and then the distribution that we have, that we can actually help lots of travel agencies or other buyers become much better at this game than they were yesterday. And then fourth within distribution, huge focus on uh, virtual payments with our confirm a business. So yeah. I feel really good about what we've done and a big part about this as scale and the pace of innovation here is very different than it was historically. And then both in the airline IT business and the hospitality solutions business, it's building off the core PSS and CRS business, but then it's really best in class next gen retailing solutions that we have built. And so it's not that hard to build something that nobody uses. It's hard to build something that works at scale mm -hmm. um, and is resilient with the right security around it and the right speed around it, um, those things are not easy to do for new entrants. Um, and, and obviously, if they're new entrants who are building things that are compelling, um, we're going to look to partner with them and look to integrate their capabilities to make sure we bring the best capabilities to our customer base. There, there's, I have no pride of authorship there. I just have pride of outcome. So your um, analogy about streaming was quite interesting because I just jotted down, you, know, you see those charts and how quickly... Um, things get adopted. So uh, Netflix was three and a half years, Instagram was two and a half months, and ChatGPT was, this is to get to a million users, was uh, five days. So do you generally expect the pace of innovation in travel to pick up? Yes, absolutely. I think on. I, I think it's important to understand that on the B2B side, where you're dealing with corporate travel, for example, um, and you're dealing, it, it's a little bit different. So you could say one analogy would be looking at, at systems like Oracle or SAP, which serve, or ADP, which serve the corporate buyer, right? Then on the other side, you'd say, well, there's consumer applications like Booking or Expedia or Airline.com, where it's a very different user experience. In corporate travel, in managed corporate travel, you're blending the two. It's the utility of what the corporation is looking for with all the business logic around it, with the expectations that the traveler has to have a consumer-like experience. That's And so the integration of those things is much harder. But I think in terms of what we've built and where the market's going to go, you're going to see transformation there very rapidly. And that's when I mentioned the technology arms race. That's going to become very apropos for those people who compete and win in that space.
the three kind of use cases you gave yesterday on the call where the where you've you know you've the sort of boosting productivity and innovation and um automating some of the things which would traditionally be done manually and the third thing was kind of you know you talked about your data set and you touched on it earlier on as well and 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 I guess you, you you I guess what you were talking about is the fusion of your the data that you have with AI and embedding that into your solution. So just give us one or two examples of of where that might sort of play out. Yeah. So for example, let's say you, you asked earlier about personalization, and let's say that we were the NDC IT provider for an airline. We're we're doing it on the airline side of the NDC API, and what you're trying to do is help them create a customized or personalized offer for Linda. If we've got lots and lots of data that's feeding that merchandising engine, and we know a lot about you as the traveler, we can then we can then push something to you that's going to be very, very appropriate and relevant for you. And you're going to say click and you're going to convert as a customer. If we didn't have that same set of overall quantum of data and we didn't know enough about you, we didn't have all you know the different data marks, then the relevance of what we push to you is going to be much lower and we'll convert at a much lower rate. So mm -hmm. for example, in our retail intelligence or our offer capabilities or NDC IT, that's very, very important. The quantum of data informs the learning and informs the ability to personalize the offer. So I'm very conscious of time here. You took up the president role in uh, January, I think it was January 22. Um, and you added CEO last year. So just to round out here, what have been the greatest kind of wins, milestones for you personally so far? Well, it's been, um, I think I, I think you knew when I left uh, Carlson, I had retired in 2021 and I was 50 years had, old. Had you though, had you really retired? Um, I would tell you emotionally after going through <laughs> more than a year of COVID and, and just the challenge of that yeah. and the impact to the people, um, I was emotionally spent. And I was not looking for anything else. And Sabre came to me and I was very fortunate. Um, I have been deeply impressed by the people here. The amount of intellect, the desire to win, the commitment to the customer is absolute at Sabre. And that's been the most fulfilling part uh, for me in this journey. Um, we have really focused on the customer. Um, you know, our purpose here is customer obsession which is we are here to make our customers successful, to deliver on our commitments to them, whether they are explicit or implicit. And I think there's a real ethos at Sabre today that orients around that. Um, there's no question that there have been uh, challenges at Sabre when you look at our balance sheet and when you look right. at the, the GDS marketplace or some of the trailing challenges with airline IT, but we're innovating at a very different pace than I understand we have historically. Uh, we have changed our technology infrastructure dramatically we have a very focused uh, strategy and product roadmap today. Um, there's not at our senior team, including me, there's not a person on our team who sat at that table at the beginning of COVID. So this is not your grandmother's saber. Um, yes, I'm very proud of the legacy this company has, but we're building a next generation modern technology company. And we really want to think about how we can disrupt not only the industry in a positive way, but also ourselves. So, as I look at it, it's just been, it's challenging every day, but I've had a tremendous amount of fun. Uh, I wouldn't trade the opportunity for anything, but it really orients around the people, our people, and then the customers I get to engage with every day. So just briefly, because, you, you know, you did mention the challenge of the balance sheet there, and let's not pretend that it hasn't been, um, that it's been an easy ride because we know it hasn't, but is there anything you'd have done differently? Um, you know, we didn't, Sabre didn't get any government assistance. And so the challenge for the balance sheet is really Sabre burned through a lot of cash, like many companies did during yeah. COVID. And to took on that a lot of storm. debt, right? We, and we took on more debt. Um, and part of that was we funded our technology transformation and we made that conscious choice to do it, which I think was the right decision. But because of that, we took on more debt. With the interest rate environment changing, debt became much more expensive over the last yeah. couple of years than it was historically. And so we have more debt than I would like. Now, the good part about that, if you're an equity or a stockholder, the equity is a relatively small component of the enterprise or total value of the company. And so as we execute our strategy and our plan, and I believe we'll have a very different financial profile two, three years from now than we do today, there's massive equity value creation opportunity for our business. Um, 
So no, I, I think since Mike and I took over and Mike is our CFO, who's terrific, yeah. we have really focused on extending our, our debt maturities, aligning them to our future cash flow generation, and really giving ourselves control of our strategic and our financial destiny. And I think that we, we've done everything we've needed to do. Um, uh, again, it, would you prefer to operate with no debt? Yes, of course. But I yeah. think from a value creation perspective and the need and the willingness to focus, uh, we're in a very, very good position. So, you know, I feel great. We we have a long runway here and we just have to execute against the ambitions and the promises we've made to ourselves and to the marketplace. Right, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks for the catch up. Thank you, Linda. Take care and uh, great to see you. Cheers.